The fishing here on the main lake of Gigantica is not for the faint hearted. This trip always builds up so much. There's, I've done like 25 this year, I think. Um, and that's all we've done, talked about and talked about and talked about for the past four weeks. Now we're here, the nerves have come, draw's coming, I'm not enjoying it. I've been thinking about this trip for literally months. The nerves are starting to build now. The, the draw's horrible, no one likes the draw. Um, but, uh, you know, I've turned you into a hero or or someone trying to make something out of nothing. If I get in my top eight choices, I reckon I've got a good chance. Yeah, I've only been at quarter seven months. I'm the only guy on the main lake that hasn't fished it before. So I think I'm a little bit thrown in the deep end because obviously all the guys know all the swims and they know the spots or they've, they've fished a lot of the spots before. So, um, but no, it's confident. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all, all about that ball, isn't it? It's a couple of years since I've been on one of the work trips and the last time I was on the main lake that you can see behind me. This year, however, over on the road lake. Now is the draw time. Always get butterflies. I normally do rubbish in them, but you know what? Every swim over there is capable of doing a few fish. Just looking forward to getting going now. Right, okay, then we're just back to the main lake draw. Obviously starting with Tom, going around the room. So Tom, you want to put your hand in the bag and pull out your ball. No looking, please. I'm really pleased with my draw. To be honest, I was going to be pleased with anything with a single figure after what's happened before. So, number five, brilliant for me. Um, I picked a pole. It's not a swim I think I'm going to catch loads and loads out of, but it's been very consistent over the last few weeks. So, I'm hoping that throughout the week I'll get a few chances, but I'm happy. Yep, uh, managed to, to draw fourth, which absolutely over the moon with, you know. I've got my second choice, Alcatraz, so literally so happy. Um, just got to fish it right now and hopefully end up with a few bites. So, so number one. Come out first again. We, uh, I've gone on Coe's Point. Um, I've fished it twice before, um, so I'm really happy with that. Uh, I was torn between the cutler swims, but I went for that in the end because um, the, the main one I want, the big one, does come up there quite a bit. So let's hope he's out there somewhere. Well, how about that? I've got a number one in the draw, but it was followed by zero. Hashtag standard. But you know what? Come out 10th. I've actually got my fourth choice of swim. I'll take that. I've drawn the beach, which has done the biggest fish of the year so far from this lake at 68 pounds, or the biggest fish of the summer anyway. So it's not like the, the, it's frozen over, but um, you know, it's gonna take some solid angling to get a few bites out of there this week. People that have the, had the best success on the main lake this year is people that have done, like we've, like we've talked about before, is keep into their spots, kept the morale up, kept confident in what they're doing. That's really all you need here, is just keep, keep confident in what's going on, Keep your rigs how you'd fish at home. Don't try over complicating anything and basically don't fry your own brain with what am I fishing right, am I fishing wrongly. Just keep it how you would anywhere else really. At the end of the day you're here, it's a holiday. Everybody that comes out here is all pretty much getting time off work and that. So first and foremost enjoy it and people that enjoy it the most are those who succeed really. Let it happen. Uh, my second piece of advice for people coming out here is Again, spend that extra time on a Saturday, find the spots that you're happy with, you're happy to fish for a week, and just, you know, just keep everything regular, no drastic changes, just just keep, keep, keep to what you know, and it'll happen, you know, it's, it's one of them waters where consistency is the key, really. On week sessions like this, it's really important to interrogate your swim at the start of the week, find exactly what's out there, select your spots, and stick with them. The worst thing you can do is go out, not really put a lot of effort into it on the first day because you're tired, and then three or four days in, you're bringing in weed on your hook and you're worried that it's not clear out there. Then you start interrogating the swim when there's bait out there. There could be fish around and you can end up scaring them away. So this is the marker float set, set up that I use absolutely everywhere. The rod is brand new. This is a Longbow DF X45 spot and marker. So very, very stiff, very fast recovery. It's got the new minima guides on it. 
which are super, super lightweight. The line absolutely flies through those. And it's really important for me to have a real high quality marker rod that's light but casts a long way because if you can't marker out there, then you can't fish out there. If you don't know what you're fishing on, what's the point of just whacking it out into anything? So although this is an expensive marker rod setup, to me, it's one of the most important rods in your kit. So that's coupled with a Bayesia reel. I know very extravagant as a marker reel. That's the marker braid. So it's got no stretch in it, which is really important for feeling what's out there on the bottom, both when the lead hits the bottom and when you're dragging back. And to take the force of that cast, I've got a 50 pound armor called leader on there. I join that together with a four turn water knot. And at the end of it, I've got a big loop so I can loop to loop everything on. So let's show you the marker float setup. very simplistic. So a drop zone marker float on there very aerodynamic basically it's fatter at the bottom end which keeps it stiller in the air you'll notice a lot of other floats they're thinned down by the swivel thick up by the flights and that's why they wobble about yeah so although this is a big float and it's very buoyant it flies out there really true and then on that i've got a new lead that's one of the new marker leads with the prongs sticking out the side of it and that's available in three sizes, four ounce, three ounce, and two ounce. And really we developed it with this lake in mind because you've got big clear patches out there and then you've got bits of sparse weed. And with a normal lead, you can cast into the sparse weed. The lead hits the bottom, it goes donk, it feels like it's clear. When you pull it back, it just slides through. You think I'm fishing on a clear spot. You put something out like this on the same spot, clipped up at the same range, hits the bottom, you've got to pull it back and it feels solid because those prongs are catching in the weed straight away. So if you cast one of these out and it slides, you know it's clear. And obviously when you're fishing on gravel, those prongs feel the gravel that much better and you get more vibration down the rod tip as well. The only time I probably wouldn't use one of these is if it's really weedy everywhere and you do want to skip the lead back through the weed onto a clear spot because as soon as this gets caught in the weed, you're just dragging loads back with it. And what I basically do is loop to loop that float off and then I just put the lead on on its own to start off with because you feel so much more with the lead. You think that float's really buoyant, that's taking away the feeling of the lead because it's slowing it down in the water. So cast around with just the lead first of all, find your clear area, then go around the distance stick so you know how far it is, loop to loop the float back on again, put it out there, and then you've got something to aim at with your baiting up, whether it be throwing stick or spawn, and obviously something to cast your fishing rods at as well. So that side of it is really, really important. I couldn't fish in a swim not knowing what's out there, and if you've got a balanced setup like that, you'll be able to cast it absolutely miles and know every single inch of the lake bed. Most of my personal fishing will see me leave work at five o'clock in the evening, make my way to the lake, and gone again by about seven in the morning. However, on occasions I may want to be there a little bit longer, or one of my children may want to come along as well. The Tracker have released a utility front that goes onto their Tempest Brolly. It basically makes what is an overnight shelter into a full-on two-man bivvy, which makes it ideal for me. Clips on around the centre boss, two more buckles around the side arm, and then it pegs down at the front. You then simply put in three support arms, two on the side, one on the front, which obviously gives it the, the support that it needs. And then once it's all pegged out, you'll be quite surprised just how spacious this is. As I said, it makes what already is a great short session shelter into a full on two man bivvy for a trip like this to France, or even for taking extra people along with you. Yeah, being the new guy on the lake obviously uh, worried me a tad. Everyone else got so much experience on the lake, um, fished it numerous times. So yeah, to get that bite on my first first night or morning essentially is 
was, was wicked. Really, really tough. I was a bit exhausted after the journey up. Obviously, Friday night, didn't sleep at all hardly. <laughs> Probably half an hour kip at home, but yeah, absolutely buzzing, 28 pound common. Fish was immaculate. You know, really, really long, pristine, dark, golden common. Um, just, I'd be so happy to have caught that in England, you know, let alone in a, in a holiday venue in France. But yeah, the fish here just, Superb condition going by the first one I've caught, so hopefully if something bigger comes along it'll be just as nice looking and, and yeah, it'll, it'll go in the net again. So. Obviously coming to Gigantica, I knew there was potential for me to be fishing at, at long range. I was going to be putting out a lot of bait too. I've been using the Daiwa Longbow X45 spod rod. It's coupled with the Daiwa Emblem spod reel. Uh, a reel I've used for, for many years. <clears throat> Never ever let me down. True workhorse. And when you are casting those distances, putting out a lot of bait in one hit, it really helps. Your arms do ache after the end of a, of a good bait, baiting up, you know. It's the, the Emblem spod reel makes light work of that really. It's really important that obviously if you've got some real top end fishing rods uh, that you can cast a long way with that, that you don't cheap out on a, on a spod rod. You really need um, something to match them fishing rods because nothing worse than finding a real nice area um, at long range and then not being able to hit it with your spod rod because it's not, it's not man enough to do the job for you. When delivering large quantities of bait um, at long range you really need a line that's going to do the job for you, something that's real, that's going to be really durable um, and something that's thin enough to, to obviously take you out there. This week I've used the Corda Spot Braid um, coupled with an Armour Cord Leader in £50. I really feel like if I was fishing 35 wraps I, I could hit it. They really, really go out there well. Important fact is just to keep, keep this, the braid wet um, and it'll, it'll work wonders for you. You know, you, you shouldn't have any issues with it and you should get all your bait to your spot effectively and efficiently. It's only the first morning and Jay fishing over in Scotty's has got one of the super beasts. Yeah, 54. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> You're allowed, You're allowed. <laughs> 54 and a couple of ounces. Yeah. Yes. yes, get in, man. Get in. Mate, I'm absolutely buzzing. That 54 2 is a new overall PB for me. I've never caught anything, no, you know, 10 pound lighter than that. You know, when you're back at home, you think, oh, I'd love to have just a bite on your first morning so you can relax, you know, you can take the rest of the week in your stripe. But when they get to a certain size, it's hard to gauge how big they are. But deep down, I thought that's got to be my first 50 pounder, and luckily it was. Absolutely brilliant. Ring of Love first came about, I reckon, probably 20 years ago now, which makes me sound old, unfortunately. I always use the, I'll sometimes be searching the bucket for sort of five, 10 minutes, the smallest tigers I've got. You need your crank choddy on here, size four barbless, and about three or four inches of 20 pound mouth trap. I do a seven turn knotless knot, pull it tight, make sure that your hair that you're gonna put back through to create the D is dead straight once you've tightened the knot down. Otherwise you're gonna sit, it's gonna sit offset. So um, put on your medium rig, rig ring, back through the back of the eye, trim it down till you've got about half an inch tag, burn it down with a lighter, just push it so it blunts off the end and pull it back through so you've got a, a tiny, not a massive D, but a fair sized D on the back of the hook. You need a size 11 ring swivel, tie that down. You, you don't, I, I see people using them really long. You want them short, you want them so that they're finished at about two inches. 
maybe two and a half inches, back through the, the loop, the ring swivel, tie it down, um, pull up through the ring swivel, bend of the hook, wet, make sure you wet the knot down all the time and just pull it tight. Don't, don't completely stretch it so that you're pulling the mouth trap, thinning the mouth trap out. Just do it so it all pulls down tight. Tidy your knots up nice and tidy and then you're ready to go. Uh, boom section, you need 25 pound mouth trap, size eight ring swivel, a size 11 ring swivel. So you've got one on each end, literally three turn blood knot each end. Tie the rig to about four inches because when you pull it, you're going to get another couple of inches as the knot straighten out. So in all, wet both knots, two pullers, pull them tight. Again, tags off. So you want the boom ending about five, six inches. So I pick out the four smallest uh, tigers out of the bucket that I can find. Two bits of eight mil cork, about 10 mil, 10 mil wide I would say, two bits of that. Cut them off, thread them onto the bait floss. Um, and then you wanna, so that you'll end up with six pieces of bait in respect, two bits of cork, to four tigers. Tie them in an overhand knot, um, three knots, pull it tight as you can so they're not moving, it's a pure, proper ring. And uh, then you tie that on the back, onto the back of the D, on the chob part of the hook length, and uh, balance it up, bit of putty on the chob part, and trim the cork down so it looks like the tiger nuts in, in respect. And uh, yeah, check it in the edge, make sure you're popping up well, and it's good to go. Over on the road lake, Spooner's into his first fish, but he's not exactly going according to plan. Since I've been here, down to my right, there's been a lot of fish activity and I've had a rod down there all night. Started off with a pink bait, changed to a yellow bait, still nothing. So this morning, made another change and went with a, with a white one, doused in Wonderberry Goose. So really, really attractive. And it's done the job. Within about an hour, absolutely ramped off, took loads of line. I could tell from the off it was quite a good fish. But if I'm honest, I thought I'd lost it. I got it all the way back, just down in close. And there's a real overhanging snag and it just absolutely locked me up. And if I'm honest, I was convinced it was gone. But Buzz the Beardy Bailiff came to a rescue in Nicole the boat. We went out, didn't have to go out too far, and I still wasn't sure it was there, but after sort of fighting our way through the undergrowth, I just saw the carp just sitting on the bottom, sulking really. Luckily, still attached, it just got my, my safe zone leader actually just gone round a branch, but I managed to sort of get that off, sort of teasing it in, actually got Buzz to lift the net around it. The rod was redundant. Well, you saw the celebration, <laughs> high fives, it felt like an absolute victory. <laughs> There we go, first bites are always nice, nice to get off the mark wherever you go, but at 32 and a quarter, not many better ways to start. For this trip, I've decided to use my Daiwa Mission 12 foot, three and a half pound rods. Now, I knew that the fishing here would be a lot of fishing around about the 80 yard mark, which this rod's perfect for, but having used it for quite a bit, if I need to cast further, I know that I can. One of the most important features as a carp angler, I'm sure you'll agree, because we're all tackle tarts at heart, is exactly what the rod looks like when it's sitting on the rest. And I've got to be honest, they look really, really good. With a nice slim build throughout, you've got a 50 mil butt ring, real minimalist black whipping, standard reel seat, winches the reel up and there's no movement in it, when you're, certainly when you're playing a fish. And finally on the butt, you've got the, the shrink wrapped handle that just finishes it off perfectly. But what's really impressed me is when I'm playing a fish. As soon as you pick the rod up, the rod just hoops over, you're in total control. But once you get it under the rod tip, if that carp takes one more lunge, the rod just simply goes with it, up it pops into the net. Happy days. But the most common mistake that people make is baiting up at the wrong time of day. You want to be baiting up between one and three. That's the best time to bait up. When the sun's at its highest, the fish are not feeding at that sort of time of day. And that's the best time to bait up. Key to success on the road lake is basically picking your free spots on the Saturday, keeping to your spots and fishing to your spots. Make sure you're clipped up at those distances and you hit that spot every time you cast. If you don't, reel in, redo it again. That's the key to success. The best bit of advice I would give is to go onto the internet, go onto our website, check all the information on swims, bait, rigs, social media, check Facebook, Twitter, 
they're done up to date daily. That's the best information you can get on where the fish are coming from, how much bait is going in and what bait is being used and the best rigs for that time of year. I arrived at my swim yesterday at about half three. To be honest, I've probably stood in my swim for about a half hour. I wanted to see fish show and in the end I actually saw probably four or five shows in about half hour. So I was really pleased. So I've got a large spread of boily um, just from beyond that large tree there. Uh, I've got one at just sort of throwing distance, like just, well, pretty much like a long arm, underarm throw. So I went one with a size six crank, end trap semi stiff, uh, just stripped back just below the, the eye. Uh, I had a 15 mil mainline Bonoffi wafter on, and that was the first one that went over me. Welcome to Bob's Beach at Gigantica and welcome also to Chateau Fairbrass. Uh, this is my bivy of choice and has been for the last few years. It's the Tempest V2 and basically it came about through fishing with Daryl out in Belgium and seeing how quickly he was setting up and packing away and moving onto the fish. And I thought I just had to get me one of those bivvies. I love the Armo bivvies, I love the stability of them, but this one goes up and down so quickly, it's a real edge. And this particular one is a one man, it's just big enough for me. It's quite a spacious one man actually. The bed chair goes right to the back of it and I keep all the stuff that I'm not gonna use a lot at the back of the bivvy. So my food bag, my camera, spare bits and pieces that I'm not gonna use a lot, they go at the back. And then at the front, I've got my rucksack and my tackle box, you know, my rig safe, various other tracker bags like my leads bag and all that sort of thing. Obviously my brew kit and stuff at the front as well. And then a couple of the wicked tracker buckets. I don't know how I fished without these prior to them coming out. A couple of additions to the V2 recently. Um, first of all, the skull cap on top of the bivy. That is an absolutely amazing bit of kit. Not only does it cut down on condensation significantly, but you get a lovely little peak at the front of it as well. You can see here, I've got the, um, the vents on the front there. So I've got the mozzie panels open. Um, that obviously lets more air through when it's really warm. In the evenings when the mozzies are really bad, I zip the door down, but obviously have the panel rolled up so I can see through the mozzie mesh. Um, you still get a brilliant view of the lake uh, and the little mozzies can't get you. And then the vents at the back, they're open during the day when it's really warm. It's amazing how much transfer of heat there is just by opening those. And if you've got a breeze, it goes right the way through the bivy. And I'm finding I'm able to get a few hours kicked during the day, even when it's hot, just because I've got those vents open. Thing packs down into a bag really, really quickly. The skull cap stays on all the time. It fixes on really easily. Just a few attachments that you add to the poles. They, they're all neatened up with little caps on the end of them and it just slips through and Velcros up and that gives it a nice tight look so it's not flapping around in the wind. I can still get my throwing sticks underneath there. I used to slot them into the top of my Tempest and they just about fitted in there and they still do with that. I'm using in the tensioning strap, which gives it this lovely shape. So there's enough height I can see out or into the lake. I'm not crouching down like that. Can't really get my head around these really, really low, really squat bivvies where you spend all day like that. I want to be nice and comfortable. And then actually on the bed chair itself, this is the Level Light ELS. So it's the one that's got rope in the middle section rather than uh, bungee cords. And that means it doesn't sag in the middle at all. And I really like that. It supports my lower back, you know, which I do get problems with. So by having the, the bed chair really tight, it just almost feels like a normal bed at home. And then on that, I've got a layer of sleeping bag at the moment because it's warm. I'm either sleeping on top of the bag completely, so I'm not in it whatsoever, or just in the first layer at the top. And that's got a Pertex top and bottom to it, so it doesn't get too hot and you're able to get in and out of the bag really easily. 
in the winter time, I have two layers above me, so I'm into the bit that's fleece lined on either side, and that keeps you so much warmer in the winter. The last new item of tackle that's only just come out this year is what I'm sitting on here. It's a transformer chair. It's got to be the best chair that I've ever used. I've always used stuff to support my back in the bivy. Really, really comfortable, but this one turns into a low chair as well. Again, super comfortable. You can sit out by your rods or sit in the bivy as well. That's my bivy of choice. That's how I set it up and all the bits that go with it. If you're the sort of angler that does loads of different types of fishing like me, this is what I recommend. I'm more nervous than on my wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely quoting that. Don't you put that David. <laughs> I'm more nervous than on my wedding day. <laughs> Line singing. <laughs> I'm more nervous than on my wedding day. My knees are shaking, but it's a fish on. Gorgeous, gigantic scaly, 25 and a half. Absolutely buzzing with this one. Absolutely gorgeous. Well happy. Back here on the road lake, the fish have been crashing out all morning, which has made a few of the anglers switch over to zigs. Let's just say it was definitely the right decision. I can see your foot is proudly on a prize, mate. You're off the mark. It is, mate. There's one in the net. I had one before this that's literally wiped my other two rods out. Um, oh, bite yeah. on camera! <laughs> Go on! Hectic action on the zigs. Yeah. There we go, mate. 32 and a half pound. Yeah. New PB? Yep, definitely. Smashes my, uh, my PB. How are you feeling? Buzzing, mate. Uh, Top of the range, as I say. <laughs> I do where you come from. <laughs> oh, good work, yeah, mate. Epic, mate. And uh, by the looks of your swim, mate, there's still a few there. So yeah, I'll definitely. Share. Get this one back and some yeah. more rigs out. Get some more. We love a PB <laughs> don't we, mate? <laughs> Good. It feels just like I say, just plodding, just nodding its head. It looks hopefully like it's going to be another PB, possibly a mid 30. Um, lovely fish, mirror. Led me a merry dance on that bar again, but yeah, fingers crossed it's going to be another PB. Get it on the scales. Um, yeah, I knew, I knew it was going to be sort of possibly a, a sort of 30 pounder, maybe low 30 when I got it in the net. But um, but yeah, when I actually uh, had a look at it from from the top, it was a big old wide fish, and you could tell it was going to be a sort of a mid 30. But yeah, 38, just just shy of the magical 40, or not, not far off a pound and pound and two ounces short. A slight change of plan for last night. Down the right hand side, I've had loads of activity. I've been trying to nick bites just with little PVA bags, and I did. I had a nice 30 pound of doing so. But I didn't really feel I was ever going to get anything going by doing that. So last night, went round onto the sort of damn wall, if you like, put a marker float out so I could line it up from my swim, wrapped it up from my swim so I knew exactly where I was fishing, 
and put a nice helping of bait out. I'm pleased to say it's worked. Early hours this morning, had a real slow take, which I suppose it typifies a big fish take, so I've come out all excited. Having had a couple of smaller fish on my open water rods, this one just felt different from the start. It absolutely beat me up. Luckily, it didn't go down to the snags. It went out in open water. When it rolled over the neck, I knew it was a little bit special. What about that? Common, a couple of ounces under 37 pound, caught in a mainline peaches and cream wafter over a big bed of 18 mil essential cell. Let's have a little look at the bait I've brought for this trip. When preparing for a trip to France, there's so many different bait options that you can go for. And if I'm honest, it can be quite confusing as to what to go for. 10 kilos of this, 10 kilos of that, some hemp, some maize, whatever it may be. My advice is simple. Use something that you've already got loads and loads of confidence in. I use the essential cell back home quite a lot. So that's what I brought out here with me. It's high attract, fish love to eat it. Um, I've just bought it in the one size. I've only bought it in 18 mil, but with a couple of baiting tools, I just make my own bait stand out a little bit more from others. So to start with, I just take a load, I just run it through a cutter, just to give loads of different chops, loads of different size bits of bait. Even some of the bits that have already been chopped, they'll go back in there as well, because then you get lots of different sizes. It's not just whole boilies and half boilies. You really want to give the carp something to think about rather than just picking up 18 mil boilies. And that's exactly what doing this will do. Once I've done a few through the cutter, I then bring in the crusher as well so that I've got some crumb out in the water. It does a couple of things. It travels up and down the water column. It stays on the bottom for long periods of time. So when a carp does come in, they can pick up the bigger bits easily and start to clear the spot. But those tiny bits will keep them around for that little bit longer. So maybe when you've had a bite, just a few more spoms over the top can really keep them rooting around and can make one bite turn very quickly into two or three. So I'm just gonna run a bit through the crusher now before showing you the final additive. As I said, I like my bait to stand out a little bit more if I can. There we go. Finally, as an additive to the bait, I love adding hemp oil. It does a couple of things. It almost feels like you're chumming for carp when you've cast a few out in the spawn because you get this massive slick up here that whichever way the wind's traveling, you see it travel off. And I can't help but thinking it's like, it's like a highway for the carp. They see it, can't help but follow it to source and hopefully that will start the feeding process. I'm just going to douse a little bit on there now. There we go, not too much, just to cover a few of the baits. What that will also do though, as soon as you get a bit, of, there's a ripple on the water as well, and carp come in to feed. Because of the oil, they tend to disturb the bits that are perhaps caught under the bait or soaked into the bait, and that comes up, hits the surface, and creates the same flat spot that you see when you've done your spotting. And I always think, as soon as I see that, I know there's fish feeding, and get really confident it's just a matter of time before you get a bite. Then it's on to the hook bait. Now, lots of people like to match the hatch and fish exactly the same as they're feeding. I don't. I prefer a high attract hook bait that in my head means I'm going to get a bite quicker. When I'm fishing back at home, I have probably 12 hours fishing time a week just as an overnighter. And whilst I want the carp to feed on the bottom bait, I want to catch them quickly. And the way I do that is to pre-prepare hook baits. They're always from the mainline stable. You can see here I've got some peaches and cream, essential IB and Bonoffi wafters, but they're all different colours and soaked into various different goos for, for periods of about six weeks, which means the goo soaks into the core and the whole time it's out in the lake, it might be for 24 hours, it's pumping out attraction for that entire time. And I can't help but think the carp just find it irresistible. They're drawn in because of the big bed of the essential, but can't help but nick that hook bait quickly. That's the theory. Hopefully, I'll put that into practice in a minute. Over on the main lake, Rob fishing in Coes Point has got an absolute monster. Have a word. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure, man? How long is that? <laughs> Big 57, 12. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Said you wanted a big and bruv, didn't you? Yeah. Hey? 57, 12. 57, 12, bruv, yeah. Well done. Yeah. Now lift that. Good work. Well done. <laughs> well done. I mean, buzzing, uh, obviously. Um, absolutely over the moon to get one uh, that big, but so soon as well. Yeah, a bit, bit of personal pressure off, you know, came out, came out first, 
so there's always a bit of pressure there uh, from the lads. You know, the, the fish have been out, they've been black on me um, the last, well, the last 24 hours or so. So I want to catch more fish, who, who doesn't? Um, but yeah, uh, obviously one bigger than that would be, it would be awesome. Um, but no, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not too fast. Another few bites or a couple of bites would, would do me nicely. Um, but I'm, I'm over the moon with that one. So yeah, if I don't catch one bigger than that, I'm not bothered. Blowback rig, uh, it's a rig I've used a lot, like a lot in the past in my fishing. Uh, basically it's, it's, a, it's my go-to bottom bait rig uh, because the hook holds are just, you know, always been mega um, with, with a heavy bait. So I think they, I think the blowback rig gives uh, such good hook holds um, because of the. Well, I fish it with quite a long hair, um, so the separation between the bait and the hook um, when it's when it's when the heavy bait is blown back, it gives the um, the hook like precious few uh, extra seconds in the mouth um, to to catch hold in the bottom lip. Um, yeah, generally they're they're a good like inch inch and a half back depending on the length, length of your rig. It's the separation, I, I'd never fish, personally I'd never fish it, um, that rig with a, with, a, with a short hair. So I tend to use the standard, like straight out of the bag bottom bait, um, or a snowman, which is what I'm doing on this occasion, just with a small pop-up on the top of a, of a heavy bottom bait. So it's still a heavy bait, um, but it's just got a, a, a little element of buoyancy on it and a, and a, and a bright, uh, a sort of a sight bob, if you like. So first stage of the rig would be to strip uh, around six inches of the of the coating off of the braid, and then tie a uh, tie a hair loop. Then I'll cut um, the the rough length or a little bit longer than I want the rig. Cut it off the spool. Then the next step is tying um, just the rig ring on. Um, so yeah, to secure the rig ring, I just do uh, an overhand knot, um, just a single overhand knot um, that allows you to to adjust the rig ring if, if you need to. Thread the hook through the eye, uh, oh, sorry, through the rig ring. The hook's then whipped on um, with a knotless knot. Generally, I'll use around eight, eight or nine turns. Um, and then next up is the kicker or the shrink tube. Um, once your shrink tube and your kicker or your kicker is on, you put, I'd thread, thread uh, an anti-tangle sleeve on, do a figure of eight loop knot on the, on the end. Um, and this, this allows me to quick change the rig. Um, using quick change swivels, so um, it's just yeah, just purely for quick change purposes. Add a couple of little blobs of putty um, and your hook bait, and away you go. The number of bites for the road lake was already well over 100 by this point, and now the big one started to show up. Forty pound, forty pound twelve. <laughs> I had that absolutely amazing common this morning. I've been putting more bait out throughout the day, just topping it up. The same rod's just gone again, and I've got a bigger and even more amazing common from what was a pretty boring fight. It did nothing. I really thought it was a small fish, and it surfaced like a, like a submarine coming out of the depths. I haven't weighed it yet, but the two guys are already back on the spot. We're we'll going to have a look at the fish, and hopefully get another one. Well there we go ladies and gents, 44 pounds 6 ounces, I told you it was an epic common, but it just goes to show that regular baiting in something you believe in, the results are there to be had. I can't put into words how amazing this carp is. Right, just have a quick little look at the rig I'm using this week, and while some bits are a little bit fiddly, it actually couldn't be simpler. To start with, I've got a size 4 crank barbless hook, and that's knotless knotted to some 18 pound supernatural in gravel brown. Then does come the very small fiddly bit. You've got to actually tie a very, very small overhand loop here to get a real, real short hook section. The next part is the new boom material, and it's crimped at both ends. Now this end, it's a very, very small loop of no more than maybe sort of a mil and a half in diameter. And what I then do is, is thread the loop from the supernatural section through, 
pass the hook back through, just like the old loop-to-loop -loop knot. Really, really simple, but incredibly strong. Coming down to this end, I've crimped again a slightly longer loop, which allows me to quick change it onto a swivel under here. And that's all covered up with a cut down piece of dark matter anti-tangle sleeve. With the putty here as well, what it means when in conjunction with a sort of slow sinking wafter hook bait, once you've cast out, it means that this will push this section away from the lead as far as possible, and then the bait will come down to rest nicely on the bottom. And once that's in conjunction with this heli style setup as well, it can almost be cast anywhere. I don't think this one's going to go 40, but I'd say, it's a, I'd say it's a 30. It's been 10 years since I broke my PB. It feels great. Absolute carnage in my swim. I haven't got any rods left in the water. Speechless, really. Um, yeah, PB broken. fish continued to show on the main lake, even though it was well past bite time. Saw one show on my spot. Both bobbins are actually up in the blanks, so obviously I didn't know. I thought one had gone through, had a bite, had gone through the other rod. Um, so I didn't know, really know which one to pick up at first. So I've just grabbed one and there was a fish on. So uh, happy days, started playing it in. Uh, came in all right initially. And uh, it was where, under, when I got it onto the rod tip, it was just, Fight, just fighting really hard. I could see it was a good fish eventually when it came up off the bottom. Um, and uh, yeah, just ploughed around probably five, five, six minutes. Um, and then Jay was there with the net and got it in first time basking. So yeah, happy days. Then uh, thought better, better have a look, see what's going on with this other rod. Um, picked that up and there was a fish on that as well. So um, started playing that and coming absolutely good as gold. Um, right the way in and then uh, much easier than the last one and um, just come straight up and pretty much straight into the net and uh, yeah two two lovely 30s 34 and a half and 38 pounds so happy days yeah so <coughs> first fish um, was a uh, carp called the clean fish um, well well spawned out 38 pound um, looked immaculate lovely uh, deep uh, deep body big fins massive gob um, yeah considering it has recently spawned really really good condition Second fish, um, fish called Quasi, um, again spawned out at 34 pound, eight ounces, but that's a, yeah, a bit of a character, shall we say, sort of a, a bent, kinked back, um, but again, love, nice carp, um, great big mouth, um, wrinkly old skin, um, yeah, well, well chuffed, well chuffed to get them to. So yeah, obviously wanted to get the rods back out really quickly, um, quickly wrapped them up, um, put both fresh rigs on, um, fresh baits, and back out. The spot, well, spot seems to be rocking a little bit now, so the um, plan is just to keep, keep the bait going in, um, keep fishing that same spot. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna move the rigs at all. Uh, what the fish are clearly happy to feed there. Um, so yeah, just gonna keep baiting up and uh, doing what I've been doing and hopefully keep a few more bites coming. Good in. miles long isn't it? 18 foot. <laughs> 18 foot? Yeah. I go and stand in the car. How deep park. is it out there? 23. So you're five foot under? Yeah. Yeah. I've got one six foot under and one four foot under. Right. 
Be about right then. Yeah, I ain't had nothing. <laughs> Playing quite hard, didn't you, for a zig? Yeah. I have confidence in the zig line and I don't want it to fall off with a barbless. Yep. What hook you got? Size 6 choddy. Size 6 choddy? Yeah. <laughs> Fish of a big understanding. Yeah. <laughs> Right, I'm going to walk back down if that's alright. Yeah, a bit white is it? Okay. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I did have a pineapple on before, but when I cast the bait, the bait stop had pulled into it where I cast the rod. So it, these are the hardest baits I had. Oh. Come on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Yes. You the man. Yeah. You the man. It's not a tiny fish, is it? No. He won't have to buy it. Lots of my fishing throughout the whole time of the year is done with a Tempest Air, and with that type of system, you do not get a front on it. Tracker have recently released an insect panel that will fit all of the Tempest family. Whether you've got the full system and perhaps are only going for a quick night, whether you've got an air like myself, or you've got the brolly, there is one for you. It goes on so easily as well. It just buckles on at the back behind the centre boss, two more clips around the side, and then finally at the bottom, two clasps to just hold it all in place. The rear is then elasticated, which goes behind the boss and behind the arm so that no insects can get in there. Then you peg it all out at the front. It gives you a door. More importantly, you can still see the lake. Air can still come through. But most importantly, no flying insects can ruin a good night's sleep. Four o'clock in the morning, had a really good take on the middle rod on a, on a snowman. And yeah, it resulted in 33 four common, one known as Bobbin's Dancing, I think named by Ian Bailey. Uh, yeah, really, really nice carp. Stay there, look at the tail. I'm using slow sinkers on, on obviously my, my bottom bait rigs. There's a couple of reasons really. Purely, uh, the, first, the first one is because um, to hit the range I'm fishing, I can't fish it with any um, PVA foam nugget or, or a, a stick of any kind because it will just hinder my casting distance. So um, I've got to fish them as a single essentially around obviously my, my baited area. Um, yeah, slow sinkers obviously aid tangle free. Um, when casting, help to um, extend the rig and, and present it well, and obviously um, neutralise the, the weight of the hook and essentially help help with hooking the carp in the first place. So. Got back to my swim after dinner, wrapped the rods back up to my spot, put, th put three new rigs on, fresh baits obviously, um, and then, yeah, I got them out first. Um, I put the rods out first so they're in position uh, and then bait up over the top. Uh, no particular reason, it's just something that I do. Was seeing quite a lot of fish long off the back of the spot. Went to bed probably around 10, 10 half 10. Um, Quite, quite tired from the, the long day yesterday. From memory, about two o'clock this morning, um, middle rods pulled up, turned off, and uh, 
I popped a, a rather large mirror and uh, Dan scooped it up uh, first time of asking. And um, yeah, there she was. We got her out onto the mat and um, quickly weighed it. And uh, yeah, 53 pound bang on. And we, we, we confirmed it then as, as definitely been a fish called the clown. Um, really, really nice, deep bodied. Um, chunky mirror, um, yeah, really clean as well. Not a mark on it, despite being uh, about about five pound down from from spawning. Um, so she's had a, had a good spawn, but yeah, looked absolutely immaculate. Lovely, big, huge, great mouth. So yeah, really, really, really nice carp. Once we'd weighed the, the, the fish, um, we we transferred it to a sack. Um, just just popped it in the sack in the margins for a few hours. Nice deep margins here, so it's never going to come to any harm. But we just wanted to uh, you know to be able to show show everyone. Such a nice fish. We want to be able to show everyone in the daylight, get some nice footage and things. So. Yeah, so once, once we got the fish out on the mat and, uh, and peeled back the, the mesh, just even more impressive than you know, to see it in the, in the light of day. Yeah, just, just mind blowing, just lovely colours, like real deep, deep chestnut brown colours, orangey belly. Yeah, just, just, you know, just awesome, awesome looking carp. Fish like that are the reason, you know, we come to Gigantica. Um, you know, they're just, they're just when, when they get to that size. I mean, they're not, you don't see carp that size every day. So, you know, to see them on the bank, they are just, they're just awesome creatures. And in here, they're, they're in such immaculate condition. You know, so they're just absolutely pristine. I mean, its mouth looked like it had never been caught. Just, just yeah, immaculate. We got in the water, I, I just got straight in. It's a hot day, um, so just jumped straight in, which was rather refreshing. Um, and uh, yeah, she was good as gold, um, whilst I held her up for a few water shots. However, it, did, <laughs> it didn't go quite to plan. She was, she, was, she was a bit lively towards the end, and I just, just, uh, yeah, just bolted off out of my arms, but she was, she was ready to go by, uh, by then. Yeah, after returning the, 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 the big girl, um, we, uh, we're still stood in the water, Dan um, was just checking the photos on the camera. All of a sudden, left hand rod is absolutely shredded off, like an absolute churner. Had a little, uh, a little um, sort of chug around under the rod tip, but he, he soon popped up, and we could see he was sort of, sort of a, a real beautiful scaly one, probably around low twenties. Twenty-three eight. Absolutely stunning uh, linear, real real cracker. So yeah, pretty chuffed with that. Here on the road lake, the guys continue to fine tune their rigs, which resulted in one thing, even more carp. Ah, hero. Stand up now, this isn't quite close. Cheers, dude. With a helping hand from Benny Boy, I managed to get another cracking mirror at a sniff under 30 pound. What a trip this was turning out to be. 
For this trip, I've opted to use the Daiwa Emblem 25A bite and run reel. It's a nice and small, compact reel that's jam-packed with features. I'll start with the mechanism at the back, which engages the free spool. Once you've got your rig into position, you simply pull the lever back, which engages the free spool. This is actually controlled by a rear dial at the back, so if you've got varying degrees of tension on that. However, once you pick up the rod, if, you've got, if you hook into a fish, you start to reel, the lever goes forward, and then you're in control to the front clutch, which is controlled by a dial at the front of the spool. Now, lots of people like to play their fish like that, getting that to sort of just the right tension. So should the fish start to power off, it can take a bit of line without risking pulling the hook out. It's a great way of playing fish, but personally, I actually prefer to use backwind. Don't know why I think it's something I started to do when I first started fishing, it's a habit that I can't break. To be honest, it feels like I'm wasting the quality clutch that this reel's got by doing that, but I can't help it. You either, you either backwind or you play fish off the clutch. Aside from that, it's got fantastic line capacity. I'm actually using the touchdown 15 pound in green, and I've got almost 250 yards onto each spool, which is more than enough. Ranges, I'm fishing up to 80 yards, and I have to say, for, for such a small reel, I'm actually casting that with ease and could easily cast much, much further. So for such an affordable reel, it really is punching well above its weight. Well, I've just put three zigs out, which is a bit of a last resort for me, but needs must at times like this. Um, I've had three pods out on the bottom for a few days now and nothing's happened. Um, I'm not massively on the fish, but I just knew that it's not really the one because I'm not getting bites. So last night I chanced my arm, put a zig out, and within 45 minutes I had a bite. So we're obviously up in the water, so tonight I've put three out. It'd be stupid not to. I think some people get confused about zig fishing. They think it's much more complicated than it is. Uh, but when you set it up like this, it's extremely simple. I've got a three and a half ounce distance cast and inline lead, an anti-tangle sleeve and the towel rubber on the end. And all of that is to stop tangles because when you're fishing with a long link of light line, you can get some tangles, but that's the best way to set it up. I've got 18 foot of zig line all the way to a 16 mil pop up, which is a bit of a crude bait really for a zig. But when you're out here, the fish are massive um, and I'm fishing at night as well. So I want something that's gonna stick out. Um, and big, again, because the fish are so big, I've got a size six hook on there and a, a coloured kick, a little yellow one, um, and that's just to make sure the line kicks out at the right angle, just to make sure it catches them. It's a devastating method, especially when they're up in the water, um, and that's why I've got three out tonight. We'll see what the night brings. Feels nice, chugging. Get in that net. Get in that net. Get in that net. Yes, got him. Come. Ah. Oh. Yeah, baby, yeah! That was a long time coming, man. I'm buzzing. Well, finally, I smell of carp, and it's a sweet smell. I've not lost my head. I had a terrible draw, came out 12th out of 13. Um, didn't really fancy this swim at all, but persevered, stayed on my spots, didn't panic, kept with the plan, and it's paid off. And I think the fish is called the Godfather of Soul, and we're gonna show you in the morning. But for now, I've, I've already re-spotted. The rod's gone out first time. I'm gonna tie some spare rigs, because um, I didn't have any tide, because I re really wasn't that confident. Um, but it's action stations now. Hopefully we're gonna get some more. Get in that net. Get in. Yes! Get in! That's awesome, man. <laughs> Nice leathery one. 
40 pound for getting three in the night. It's light in two hours, so into the sack with the other ones. Let me show you in all their glory in the morning. Check that out. The biggest one of the trio. Fish called the leather at 40 pound and four ounces. Absolutely immaculate, gigantic of carp. And uh, tastes so sweet when it all comes right at the end of the week. There he is, the fruits of not losing your head, sticking with a plan, and when the fish turn up on the baited area, the rigs are right and you're gonna get them. And too many people on here, I've done it myself, have changed too much during the week, and uh, you move away from a winning formula and end up blanking. So I've learned from this, stick to the plan and it will happen. Oh, oh yeah, awesome, Tom. Ah, oh, mate, absolutely awesome. The settings, I'll put it on. Scrub. Is it the settings? The settings, I put it on. <laughs> this is the technology that's really turned it round for me this week at Gigantica. It's an updated version of the rig I used a few years ago on Alcatraz to devastating effect. I managed to snare fudgies and a couple of the other big ones that week, plus a load of other fish. Um, it's super, super aggressive. And like I say, I've updated the way I tie it, basically to make it more tangle free and to make it easier to change the hook after a bite. I also used it on Coe's Point a couple of years ago to really good effect when I had the twin and a few others. And the, really the principle behind the rig is it's a very, very aggressive hooker of fish. The cog lead system is much more aggressive than the normal lead clip. I started off fishing running lead clips on here because they cast so well and they just never tangle. Um, and a few days into the session, I felt I needed to up the ante a little bit. So I've moved over to this. And like I say, it's sailing out there perfectly, even in the dark, getting no tangles with it. And it's produced me three takes. So to talk to you about the components, working from the bait down here, I've got basically a, an 18 mil slow sinker. That's a new mainline toffee bait which I've put a new goo on top of. This is the butterscotch and corn. It absolutely reeks, got a lovely, lovely creamy buttery smell to it. And um, it's the only thing I've found that repels the silt. It's quite silty out there. And although you get a firm drop, so the lead's not plummeting in, the baits are coming back smelling. And this is the only stuff that seems to be pushing through that and still smelling the butterscotch in the morning. So basically I've got a loop tied on there that's basically loop to looped that soft bit onto the end of the boom section. So what I've basically done is folded over some armor called 30 pound, poked it through the eye of the hook, and then done my favorite whipping knot, just three turns of that. And you end up there with two hairs. And what I've basically done is cut one of the hairs off. There's no way it's ever gonna come undone. And then that single hair that's left forms the blowback system. So I've got a large ring, rig ring there that's just tied in an overhand knot and then a short hair and I've tied a couple of extra overhand knots in that to shorten it down so that there's only a small gap between the hook and the bait so it doesn't sit off the bottom too high. I've got an extender stop actually pulled into the bait so if there are crays out there it's much harder for them to get the bait off the hair. If you use normal hair stops what we reckon they can do is pull the hair stop out and drag the whole bait off the hair without eating it in situ. So that's a real good tip if you've got crays around is to use the extender stops. The hook itself is a size two curve, my absolutely favorite pattern. If I'm fishing with bottom baits, I like to use a big hook, and this one is super, super sharp and turns really aggressively. And to help it turn further, you've basically got a large kicker on there. I don't use shrink tube anymore. There's no need for steam or anything when putting this rig together. That just gets slid up over the loop before you loop to loop it on, and that forms that aggressive kicker there that's gonna turn the hook over 
and catch hold in the bottom lip. Probably about an inch of exposed uh, braid there, two bits of braid obviously because it's looped to looped on and then I've got a crimp section of the new boom. This is the 055 version and they're 0.7 crimps um, and that is super, super durable. And basically that bit remains the whole time. All I change is that end section, that soft section, uh, and the boom itself just stays on there forever. This boom is seven inches, pushes everything away from the lead really well. And then down at the lead system, this is one of the other changes I've made. Normally I would have a quick change system there, but watching Darrell fish over the years, he doesn't use a quick change system. He just uses a ring swivel and his rigs are so neat. He just gets no tangles at all. And I'm sure it's because they're so uncluttered. So I've adopted that as well in my fishing and just having a loop there onto that swivel rather than the quick change, I think helps reduce tangles even further still. The uh, cog system there, that's a three and a half ounce distance cog and the boom going down to that has to fit perfectly. So it has to be nice and tight like that. If you use them too long, they're all baggy and basically you can get tangles. If it's too short, the lead will sit funny before you cast it out. So they're all numbered to correspond with the lead itself. And that three and a half gets me out there. I'm fishing 80 yards at the most, 65 at the least. And that just flies out there onto a lead clip. And again, this is fish running. If I imitate what's going to happen when the fish shakes its head. So the lead's come off there. Yeah, but it's now running. So after the initial panic of hooking itself, the lead's just sliding away and away and away from the fish. There's no anchor point for it to get rid of the hook. And we've seen here loads of times people are winding in with no lead on where the fish have shook everything, shook the lead off and got away. And because it's not weedy, you know, we don't need to dump the lead anymore. By fishing a running rig, you can muck the fish up and get bites, which would normally just be a couple of bleeps. So that is the technology that's going out there for my last night. Um, I've got different hook baits on different rods. This one is fished over the top of a load of maize. Um, and I'm just fishing that one boily, just a carpet of maize, one boily over the top. It worked brilliantly for us on the underwater films. One of the days we just put corn in and still fished my little pink squid hook baits over the top and it worked brilliantly. So I've employed that tactic and it's worked on here as well. And then the other two are going out over the top of the boily. One's gonna be this hook bait, that lovely butterscotch. And then the other one's gonna be the classic almond, a little tiny 10 mil pop up on top of an 18 mil bottom bait. So it just sits slightly up, sitting up proud on the bottom, keeping it away from the silt. Um, and that's what's doing the business. So if you're fishing somewhere where the fish are riggy and they are super riggy on this lake, they're so, so pressured as they are on a lot of lakes in France and around Europe. If you want something that really mucks them up, the cog system is the one. Basically, um, after some footage that we see from Dan last night from the drone, um, put a 17 foot zig on, wanged it in that direction towards the toilet block, and yeah, there we go, 20 pounder. As you might have already gathered, the fishing here on the main lake of Gigantica is not for the faint-hearted. Um, when the wind gets up and is whipping across here, it is very, very difficult to get out to your spots and get accurate. And um, basically the gear I'm using is absolute top of the tree. Um, so yes, it is expensive, but it is worth it. The rods are Infinity X45, so they're basically the new Infinities that are out this year, um, still under the DF label. Um, basically, the X45 material is the, what goes into the Bazier rod, so it's all the way through the Bazier rod. That makes it very slim and very crisp. What they've done with these to improve on the old Infinities is put it just in the midsection of the rod, and that improves the recovery and the tip speed to make you cast further. The other thing they've done is added minima guides to it. And if you look at those, they've almost got no ceramic inside them. One, they look super cool and I love that. But um, also it makes the rod much lighter in the tip, which means you can move it through the air quicker, which means you cast further. So basically it's an improvement as much as they can on the old Infinity. And then coupled with that, I've got the Bazier Custom Reels, 
Again, absolutely delightful bits of kit to use, styled exactly how I want them. There's a million different combinations that you can go on. Uh, and if you look on the, the Daiwa website, go on the DCR part of it, you can design your own Bezier, have a look at what it's going to look like in the flesh before you buy it. And uh, I promise you, they absolutely stop the traffic. Um, that's loaded with 15 pound touchdown. In the beach, I'm not fishing that far out, I'm fishing 80 yards on one rod and just over 60 yards uh, on the other rod. And um, basically, you know, that's easy fishing. Um, I could be fishing out in some of the other swims 120 yards with the same rod and reel and line combination, and it would do that no problem. On places like this and any, anywhere like it where you've got big fish and you've got weed, some underwater snags that no one knows about, you want to be using thick line. There's no point coming to places like this with like 12 pound line, hooking a big one, it takes you around the corner and you get cut off. You know, so really you want the heaviest line on you can possibly have. I could fish this swim with 20 pound touchdown, absolutely no problem. That will cast for me well over 100 yards. I'm back onto the rods again for a second. They're 12 foot three and three quarter, which sounds stiff. It frightens a lot of people, but you need it for casting the distances with heavy line into the wind. Um, and when you're playing a fish, they're hooped over. They've got a lovely battle curve. I keep the rod tip high and basically let the tip of the rod do all the work and absorb the lunges of the fish. One thing you find on these particular places, people fish their clutches really, really slack. They pick up into the fish, the rod's hardly bending, and then when the fish gets close in, they see it and then start pulling really hard and pull the hook out. I do the opposite. So these reels are locked up almost solid. So when I get a bite, no line comes off the clutch. They're stretching the line at 80 yards. There's no way that they're gonna break the line. The rods are locked in solid with those backrests. They're not going anywhere. I'll pick up the rod and I'll wind until the line goes fully tight and then pull up into it. I play the fish quite hard at the start and then when they get close in, I ease off and relax. That's something you can put into your fishing. If you've got really loose clutches and you're not pulling into the fish properly at the start and then you're finding they're falling off, that can be why. So if I had to have one set of rods, it would be three and three quarters. I'd rather have the power there so I can cast into the wind when I need to. And when you get them close in, you just don't play them as hard. And then the whole thing is sitting on the single system. I'm sure you would have seen this on other masterclasses by now. Just looks absolutely gorgeous. The, here I've got the eight and a half back and the nine and a half front. So basically I keep my rods quite close together and that splays them just enough. If you fish them further apart, then you'd want two inches difference between the back and the front rest to give them a nice splay. And I use the long up uprights at the back and the medium uprights at the front. And that basically just gives my rod that nice level sort of look. It will actually point slightly up if the ground is flat, but most swims are sloping towards the water's edge. So they go nice and level. Sometimes if I want the tips up in the air, I'll swap the heads around. So I'll take the, the backrests off those long ones, put the buzzers on there, and then put the backrest on the medium. And then I've got my rods jacked up straight away without having to extend them. And it just takes a few minutes to do. Um, so that is the hardware that I'm using on this particular session. If you are fishing waters like this that are super demanding, you need top of the range kit. Corin in Alcatraz has got another stunning gigantic mirror on his favourite snowman rig. 33 and a quarter. Really? Yep. Sweet. <laughs> oh, wicked. Meanwhile, over here on the road lake, Johnny Mann is using his favoured blowback rig and HeliSafe system to great effect. £42 and five ounces of prime mirror carp. Absolutely giving me a soak in, but I don't care. The adrenaline levels are through the roof. So made up. So another fish on the little snowman rig, mainline topper, bit of a wicked tuna goo. Really wanted a 40. I've worked my way through a fair few fish now, managed to get them all in as well, which I'm pretty proud about. And uh, yeah, 40 pound four, absolutely buzzing. Another PB. This is the area that I've only just started fishing. 
produced two fish for me the first night I fished it, basically because I saw fish showing here a couple of mornings and the long area wasn't producing. So I thought I'd just put one rod here and uh, lo and behold it produced two fish and the long area produced one as well. So obviously I'm going to recreate that tonight. 20 spawns of the maize is going out there and uh, even though I've just seen a fish show on this area I'd much rather scare them with bait than put a rig amongst them and using maize only on this rod was basically sparked off by Tom uh, Dove is uh, one of the most natural anglers that I've ever met and uh, he said look you know, we're making it hard for ourselves, just all using boilies all the time. He's a real particle fan. And he said it just opens up the tactics that people can use. And the more different tactics used, the less the fish know what to expect, um, the less they get used to a certain tactic, and uh, the easier it is to trip them up. And um, it certainly worked. I wish I'd done it at the start of the week, but you know, you live and learn on these trips with all these fantastic anglers, you know, Corin. Rob Willingham, Bailey, you know, we never get a chance to fish together because we're all on different syndicates fishing for big ones. Um, and uh, this is one of the times where we get to sort of exchange ideas. You know, it's a real melting pot here, really fertile environment. And, um, you know, it improves your fishing. And uh, not only have we had a brilliant time and a proper laugh and seen some amazing fish, but I think we've all added something to our fishing because of that interaction. And long might continue. Get in! Come on! Oh. That's a battle and a half. I quickly weighed mine and put it in the sack because it was going to be light in a couple of hours. I just heard over the radio that Dalton in Big Girls was into a big fish and Garth bless him jumped straight in to net it. The fish turned out to be Mr. Angry, one of the lake's real characters, so we slipped it in the sack so we could all see it at first light. It's the final morning of the trip, which means one last cup of tea and time to get round to see what fish have been caught on the last night. Seriously impressive fish. How are you feeling? Buzzing, mate. <laughs> Not I'm waiting surprised. for 96 hours for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, what an amazing week we've had on the road. Like everybody's caught carp. Not only has, has Ben just had this 50 pound, 10 ounce beast, we've had other mirrors to over 45 pound, commons to over 47. Absolutely amazing. Do look a bit warm, mate, so there's only one thing left to do. Well, let's get it out of the way. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> Here we go, son. Yeah, highlight of the week for me, probably might sound funny, but actually getting a, a good draw at the beginning of the week, um, ending up in a in probably one of my first choice swims, which was which was really really good. All went from there really. Uh, couldn't have dreamed of a of a better week's fishing. Um, eight bites in total, six landed. Just if you'd have offered me that at the, at the beginning of the week, I'd have absolutely snapped your arm off. So it's a mega carp caught like everyone. Really really cool common. Uh, one called Bobbin dancing. 
that was a sort of a highlight for me. And yeah, and seeing Rob have a couple of 50s, he's been waiting for waiting for one over 50 from here. I think he's had numerous trips and yeah, finally to have a couple under his belt, that was cool to see. Everything really, the food was, was wicked, um, weather was really nice and, and yeah, just being here with all the guys from work. Fantastic week, can't wait to come back. My highlights of the week, uh, catching two 50 pounders. I came here wanting just one, so to get two was awesome, well chuffed. Um, having a double take as well, one, one afternoon, um, had a brace of 30s, but two, the two rods that I had out both went, and uh, yeah, brace of 30s, well chuffed with that. Um, and uh, lastly, my best mate Corin uh, falling in my swim whilst attempting to catch Rudd. Um, yeah, that was just a really, really funny moment. Well, we have come to the end of our week at Gigantica. Um, as you can see, I'm hanging it out for another bite in the 11th hour. Um, but what a week it's been, starting off with the road lake. You know, it's so nice after all the work we've done there. We've had divers in removing snags. We've created that bund to bund off what is now the stock pond because the fish were going in there last year all the time and it's very snaggy in there. And people were going around there, catching them in the day, but getting cut off a lot. Um, by putting that bund in, obviously we've forced 90% of the fish out into the main lake. There's still a few in there. Spooner's been smacking them this week and obviously they've all been getting transferred into the main lake. But to do over 200 bites, that's back to what it was like a couple of years ago. So I'm really pleased that all that effort and money that we've put into that has really paid off. And the key on there, compared to the normal weeks when we get 12 anglers on, is these guys have used loads of bait. You know, they've brought 30 key each with them and most of them have gone through it and more. And those fish, they're just greedy pigs. They love bait. If you put enough in and keep it going in, you will eventually catch them. So that is definitely the secret on there. Just good solid angling and loads of boilie. And then on here, there's been four 50s out. Um, and you know, it's been brilliant to see some of the guys that I don't normally fish with in the prominent swims, people like Corin and Rob, you know, and they've done really well out there, just boily fishing, you know, they've been consistent all the way through the week. And again, just good solid angling. No one's fishing at mega distance. Corin's the furthest one, I think he was fishing at 108 yards. Personally, I'm fishing at 80 and 65. Rob was at 96. You know, so they're manageable distances for everybody. So if you thought that Gigantica's main lake was a long range lake only, you're absolutely wrong. So hopefully we'll see a lot more lake exclusives here in the future. It's a brilliant atmosphere when you've got a whole lake to yourself. It's all your mates together. You have a brilliant holiday and catch a load of big fish as well. Last fish of the trip. Yeah, check that out. Gorgeous, carp only prettier. <laughs>